Reading 93 from the Psychological Commentaries on the Teaching of Gurdjieff and Elspinsky by Dr. Maurice Nicole. Volume 2. Quaramid, Uglay, September 15, 1945. Commentary on Inner Talking. One of the surprising things in this work is to be told that you are all wrong. Everyone probably thinks that his or her outer life is all wrong, but cannot grasp that they in themselves are all wrong. For example, all your acquired attitudes laid down, your valuation of things, may be all wrong. This is a surprise. It means that you have been following quite wrong ideals, quite wrong thoughts, quite wrong viewpoints, quite wrong ideas about what you have to do or have not to do all your life. It is for this reason that a second education is so necessary for those who wish it. I have used the term before. The work may be compared with a second education about how to live on this earth in the right way from the standpoint of the work. Looking back, I can see how many people who influenced my life in the earliest days were quite wrong. Now, if you always follow wrong standards that you have acquired, if you always think that these things ought to be done and those things ought not to be done and so on, you may be following something that can never give you any development or any peace or any inner freedom. One class of buffers in us can be formulated roughly as, quote, we never do this, we never do that, end quote. It is a marvelous experience to feel the work and observe oneself from what it teaches, and see how all one's life one has been following quite wrong aims, quite wrong ideals, quite wrong standpoints. So I repeat that this work can be called a second education, which is undergone at the expense of one's acquired education. This second education that the work gives you, and which you must seize hold of for yourselves, each individually, can produce harmonies in you and understanding that your first acquired education can never give you. This second education is, of course, at the expense of the acquired personality. You begin to examine yourself. You begin to observe yourself. You begin to see that many acquired attitudes lead nowhere and only produce a sense of discomfort, disharmony. I have often said to you recently how important it is to observe yourself from what the work teaches you as being important and what the work teaches you as not being important. You may, for example, always feel it is right to be worried about everything or constantly to write letters, giving your serious advice about some insoluble domestic situation and all the rest of it. This is done because you have acquired certain ingrained attitudes about what is right and wrong and may cause a great deal of unnecessary misery, both as regards yourself and as regards other people with whom you correspond. Now, as regards this loosening of oneself from oneself, this possibility of becoming different from what one is, this possibility of taking everything in a new way that does not agree with what one has been told to do, with what opinions one has been taught to follow, all this is the beginning of the action of the work on oneself. Our acquired opinions and viewpoints can give us no internal freedom, no internal development. For this reason, the work comes down as something overshadowing our small lives to teach us how really to behave, how really to think, how really to view life on this earth. If you study this work closely enough, you will find that it gives you a complete new way of relating yourself to life, to other people, and above all to yourself. But if you are still holding to your fixed opinions, to your buffers, to your whole acquired way of taking life as you always have in the past, you will never understand what the work is speaking to you about. Remember, it is you yourself who have to change. It is you yourself who are all wrong from the work point of view, namely from the standpoint of higher man. It is you who have a dirty and wrongly connected machine. Let us study one of the things that the work teaches us that we have to try to do. I will take 
tonight the subject of inner talking, about which the work says many things. Let me ask you this question. Have any of you been taught in your ordinarily acquired, your first education, anything about inner talking? Did you have lectures at school about the dangers of inner talking, or ever have defined to you what inner talking means? I'm quite sure that none of you has ever been taught this in life. But when you come into the work, one of the things that the work teaches you is to try to stop inner talking, because it is very dangerous. I am not speaking of people who go along in the streets muttering to themselves. That is certainly inner talking, but I am speaking about this inner talking that goes on in you all the time that is not expressed outwardly. In other words, we are talking about the inner psychological state upon which the work lays its main emphasis. The work is about our inner states. It is not about outer life primarily. It is about you internally. It is about how you are within yourself invisibly and what you go with in yourself. Here lies the point of application of the work. One of the first things that we have to study in the work is how to save force. And first of all, we have to study how to stop the waste of force before we begin to study how to save force. That is, how not to waste force. Every psychic act takes force. Nothing can happen in you psychologically, invisibly in yourself, without taking force from you. If you are in an envious state and envying someone in your thoughts, this takes force from you. Now the study of force in ourselves is an extremely complicated question. I will remind you here that when you use force consciously, as far as we are conscious in directed attention, you do not lose force, but you gain force. But every psychic act that happens mechanically takes force from you. That is to say, you waste force, and it is gone without any result. One of the forms of losing force mechanically in this way is through what the work calls inner talking. Now the work says that inner talking is difficult to stop, and you must be clever about it and find out how to deal with it. But it says, first of all, that you must be able to observe it. That is, you must begin to be aware, through self-observation, that inner talking is going on in you. Inner talking is never dialogue, but it is always a monologue. Inner talking is always negative in character. A great deal of inner talking is connected with self-justifying, namely with the attempt to put yourself in the right. You feel, for example, that someone has not treated you rightly. This will start off inner talking. The point is that you have already become negative by not being rightly treated in your opinion of yourself and have not been quite satisfied by the behavior of someone else. And you begin to become negative towards other people, towards how you are being treated by others. You then start a chain of inner talking, or rather a chain of inner talking begins automatically in you. And you will often find that it is based on justifying yourself, putting yourself in the right towards this wrong behavior of other people towards you. However, there are other forms of inner talking, often more deeply placed, which sometimes refer to people long ago dead and are due to old, laid-down gramophone records in you that something starts off. I am not going to speak tonight about these older gramophone records, because if you will learn something about these forms of inner talking that are started up now, you will get much better results in understanding the source of inner talking, and you will then be able, with this conscious strength, to go back to more ancient forms of inner talking and deal with them more consciously. The first thing that we must do in regard to inner talking is to observe it and notice what this inner talking is saying. As I said, it is always a monologue. Yet all inner talking is personal and is directed against a person. This person may be God, but then you are regarding him as a person. You feel neglected, you feel wrongly treated, you feel you have not had a chance, and so on. It is always personal. It is always directed against some person whom you either know about or do not know about. But it is always against a person, known or unknown. A person who says nothing, 
and who apparently does not appreciate you sufficiently. You can, in certain states, so identify and so internally consider that matter itself becomes personal to you as a hostile power. You knock a cup over and smash it, and it is the cup's fault. Now, in all inner talking, you never blame yourself. That would stop it. You may think you do blame yourself, and there are some very subtle forms of inner talking which are mixed up with apparent self-blame, and which are rooted in something quite different. But the more of a grievance you hold against life in general, the more you feel in general that things should have been different for you, the more frequent and habitual your inner talking will tend to become. Now, we have to cancel all sense of people owing us anything at all. This is extremely difficult. But it is one of the few things mentioned in the Lord's Prayer. Cancel what we owe as we cancel what others owe us. When a person allows inner talking to go on and on in himself, a person, he is losing force all the time. This kind of mental mumbling drags a person down very much because it is basically negative. As you know, all negative states drain force from us uselessly and are sometimes compared with the state of a person who has opened an artery and is gradually bleeding to death without knowing he is dying. To surround oneself with something that gradually becomes more and more impermeable to the impacts of life is one of the ideas of this work. This idea is expressed in many different ways. One is that one must isolate or insulate oneself from the effects of life upon us. This insulation is the idea lying behind non-identifying. We have to make a good container. We have to make a vessel in which this work and all its results can lie without being completely dissolved at every moment, completely lost by the many awkward movements of daily life. In other words, one has to be able to hold on to something strongly and more and more strongly and is exactly, it is exactly this holding on that prevents a leakage and builds up what must be built up in us. This power of having a container, this power of separation and self-remembering makes it possible for what is called second body to grow, that is, something that is not a function of external conditions. Here lies the depth of the work, and here lies the first explanation of all that the work teaches that we have to practice in this second education. It has often been said that one can either serve life or serve the work. If a small thing upsets you, if a mere spoken word spoils your life, you are not in a condition to develop. You have nothing whereby to develop, as it were, no force to create the second body. Now inner talking weakens us in this respect probably more than anything else does. It is a continual source of leakage, a force, a serving of life. What does life mean? Life means, among other things, what people say to us, how they behave to us, what comes through our senses, through what we see, what we hear. In the work sense, life is this external thing that we make contact with through the eyes, through the ears, the taste, etc. The psychological senses are the eyes and the ears. They are the vehicles of sense. They convey to us impressions from the external world in which other people exist as visible, audible things. Your psychological life is invisible to the senses of other people and to the external senses of yourself. Your psychological life is how you think, how you feel, and it is to this life, this inner psychological life, as was said, that the work directs your attention. It says, observe yourself. How do you think of other people? No doubt you think it does not matter, and that it is a private thing of your own, but it does matter, for if you think evil of other people, you are all wrong inside, and you will get into a situation after a time, if you try to do this work, that I dread to think of. All that side of you must be cleared up and made right. Here, canceling comes in. Now, 
inner talking comes practically always from wrong thinking and wrong feeling. Just as you have a rash on your skin and feel you must be ill, so if you find yourself full of inner talking, full of unpleasant phrases that automatically repeat themselves, full of justifying, you may be quite sure that you are psychologically ill. If you begin to feel this work as one of the important things in your life, you will feel extremely uncomfortable. You will really feel ill, and you will really wish to see what it is all about and how you can stop it. You will always find that it is because you are lying, because you are not facing what actually happens, let us say. You may be lying through some fantasy that you have of yourself, some absurd picture that in itself is a lie. And in this work, you cannot go very far with pleasing self-made pictures of your own nobility or value. When you begin to observe yourself deeply enough, these pictures, these fantasies begin to change. You know that you yourself are just as bad or worse than the other person. Then I am quite sure from my own experience that a great deal of your inner talking will stop. You do not seek to justify yourself. Try to change inner talking, which, as I said, is always a monologue directed against another person, into a dialogue with another person, and give this other person an existence, and say to him or her, I do not think that I have been rightly treated, and try to make this other person reply. Inner dialogue is an extremely useful thing to cultivate. You may be surprised that this other person whom you have materialized in your mind may suddenly say to you, Who do you think you are? It will be a very surprising experience to have someone in you saying that to you about yourself. And this materialized person may go so far as to say, What was it you said? Now, this will break up all your nice little negative enjoyment. You will feel that you have an enemy in yourself, or perhaps a friend, and that you cannot think or feel just as you have always been thinking or feeling in your own rather unpleasant privacy. Sometimes it is a good thing to put up the work against you when you are in inner talking. Notice what your inner talking is up to. Then repeat it to this image of the work that you have summoned up in yourself, and just see what the work says. It is calling up eyes which are rather more conscious to have a dialogue with, your mechanical eyes which are not conscious. Let us suppose you get some answer from your work eyes. Instantly, your mechanical eyes will try to make an excuse. They will say, for example, Oh, well, this is all very difficult for us. Now, let us cast this difficult situation in terms of the work speaking to you, and by you I mean your mechanical psychology that is continually wasting force in absolutely useless psychic activities. You summon up the work. The work says, Why are you negative? You say, I am not negative. And then for a moment there is silence, and then you, your mechanical inner talking, say something like this, Well, I could never do the work silence. And then you will find that your effort to divide yourself into two will rapidly die away, and you, your mechanical side, will continue to internally talk, probably with added force. Now, it is just here that a certain subtlety of self-observation comes in. I do not think that afterwards, at least for a little time, your mechanical inner talking will go quite so happily. I will end this short commentary by saying that when you are in attention, your inner talking stops. Painting is useful. What you have to understand is that inner talking, unchecked, exhausts you, wastes your force, and probably makes it possible for you to have many illnesses that are unnecessary. A person too high in himself or herself will always have a great deal of inner talking because when you are too high in yourself, the activity of self-justifying is constantly at work. Remember that one of the aims of this work is to realize our nothingness. 
Such a realization will stop all inner talking and all inner waste of force due to it. But it is extraordinary to notice in oneself and in other people what a lot of smashing it takes, what a lot of untoward circumstances are required to bring down this inner fantasy, this inner elevation, that it takes so much force to maintain.' 